Did I ever tell you the tale of the Minecraft prison community? Well, it was February 2021. YouTuber Seen Sven had just seen something that would change everything. The Dream SMP Prison. Imagine if there was a Minecraft base so secure that only you could let people in or out of it. To anyone else, it would be unbreachable and inescapable. You would be the arbiter of freedom itself. And so he created Poseidon's Vault, a Minecraft prison no one could escape. Until a mastermind emerged from the shadows and showed everyone how to escape it with just one item. This was a sign of things to come. Sven knew he had to get revenge on this menace. He didn't sleep until he had patched every weakness she'd exploited, upped every security measure until he had constructed Hades Vault, a behemoth compared to its former. But for such a genius, it only took two items to escape this one. The community was in remiss, there could be no better prison than this, until Sven and his team discovered game-breaking technology, chunk bans. Items that can kick you off a server if you enter a certain chunk. He used this technology to create the greatest prison to this day, Gaia's Vault. A prison so advanced most people couldn't even comprehend every single feature. His fans believed it was truly inescapable, but even this was no match for the greatest escapist in the world. Every one of Sven's prisons had failed. But what you don't know is that Gaia's vault was not the end. Seen Sven had one more masterpiece forming in the shadows, as top secret as you can get. A prison with hundreds of guards, thousands of cells. It would be the most elaborate and sophisticated structure in Minecraft's history. It was immune to stasis chambers, withers, and every possible escape method. But yet, we've never seen Sven's final prison. Where did it go? Who's hiding it from us? Is it so secure we can't even see the video about it? Well, let's finally learn the truth. This is the story of Seen Sven's missing prison. Prison. Neon Void. Alright, real quick, if you haven't kept up with Minecraft Presence, this series of videos basically kickstarted a community of thousands of people that to this day are still designing technology to trap Minecraft players in boxes. This is what they've dedicated their lives to, all the while wondering when the man who started it all would release his final prison. But before you can understand what happened to it, I need to tell you the same story I just told you, but without all the lies. Yeah, the prison creation myth most people know is completely wrong. First of all, there were dozens of videos of people escaping Poseidon's vault long before the famous one where you just hope the guard zones out long enough so you can break a sign behind it. And for those of you familiar with this channel, I know this is going to be hard to swallow, but most of these videos are extremely inaccurate and contain a lot of misinformation about how prisons actually work. They've been debunked a dozen times and they won't be relevant to this story. Although, fun fact, they actually inspired Siwa Gaming's escape room videos. Second, Sven did not make Hades' vault. In fact, he didn't really care to make any more prisons after Poseidon's vault. It wasn't until he saw screenshots of a prototype built by the Deaf Creeper that Sven had an idea. This prototype was by far the best prison being designed at the time, so Sven offered to build a cool exterior for it and even promoted on his channel when Def Creeper finished. Thus, Hades Vault by Def Creeper was born. Now, Hades Vault was way ahead of its time. It was actually pretty hard to break someone out, aside from just slowly mining down at the cell if you're lazy and uncreative. But as soon as it released, one absolute mad lad managed to escape it not once, not twice, not even thrice, but six times. His name was Jerry Lum, and every time Def Creeper would patch Hades, Jerry would tear it to shreds, sometimes even while Def Creeper himself was operating the prison. In fact, he's probably the reason Hades Vault had to be upgraded all the way to version 19. This guy has taken down more Minecraft prisons than you can even name. So when Def Creeper began plans on a brand new prison, soon to be Gaia's vault, Jerry was the first person he invited to help, especially because he introduced a valuable new technology, chunk bands, which is a misnomer by the way. This is the size of a chunk, this is the area they actually cover. It's 16 times bigger and it's why we call them area bands today. Would be really embarrassing if you made that mistake on a 3 million view video. Anyway, when Gaia's vault released, it was more revolutionary than any other prison, period. Not even mentioning its other tech, the simple ability to surround a base with a force field that players can't enter meant that a 100% inescapable prison might actually be possible, though Gaia's vault itself was not inescapable. In its two-year life, it's experienced natural obsolescence as new exploits get discovered. For example, its trap portals can be destroyed, and you can even blow up all the area ban items with high radius explosives. And for those of you saying, wait, doesn't Gaia's vault patch new escape plans as people come up with them? These problems are so fundamentally linked with how Gaia's is currently designed that it would be more efficient to completely restart. But you see the pattern now. Scene Sven does doesn't make prisons, but he's pretty good at finding and promoting the people who are best at it. So that leaves the big question. Which prison project is he going to promote next? Let's look at the candidates. First, there's Operator's Vault, which someone named Zeonite designed while on call with Sven. That's the prison with a bunch of duplicating command blocks that can trap admins, but it's more in a category of its own and most people have kind of forgotten about it. There's Vault 69, a prison Jerry Lum was working on, which in many ways is better than Gaia's Vault. For one, all the bands are actually protected by Obsidian. What's more, all the messy redstone, unnecessary security, and hyper-giga-mega kill checks have all been 
cleared out, making this one of the cleanest, most polished, easy to understand, gorgeous Minecraft prisons. Oh, it's almost perfect, but Jerry planned on uploading Fault 69 to his own channel, and besides, it's only barely better than Gaia's. Remember, every other Sven prison was leagues better than the previous one. Well, what was Def Creeper up to? Well, he and fellow prisoner Mining Blob had discovered some very interesting tech from old Stooping Glitch videos. A way to turn back time. If someone mines into your prison, you could basically overload the entire server with data so it can't save anyone's progress. It'll be forced to roll back to the server's previous save point, so it'll be like they never broke in at all. Look, I know this sounds too good to be true, and and it is. The glitch was actually patched five updates ago, so I mean, unless you want to make a 1.12 prison. However, Sven and his team discovered a second version of the glitch that still worked. Today, we call them memory bands, giving Minecraft servers dementia since 2021. Basically, you just do some voodoo magic to force the server to save a corrupted file to its memory. In layman's terms, if any player loads a memory band chunk, the server forgets what was in the chunk, so it crashes and rolls back. Now, surround your prison with these memory bands, and you have the perfect prison. No one can even get close without killing the server. Again, it sounds too good to be true, and, and it still is. As soon as they discovered this, Minecraft patched that one too, but keep them in your memory for now. It won't be the last time you hear about them. Besides those, there weren't really any good candidates for Sven's final prison, so prison building as a trend was over. But for those who remained, something else was happening that would start a course of events over the next six months, which would ultimately lead to the birth of Neon Void. All right, I'm gonna kinda rush through prison community history, so don't worry if you miss the small details, you just need the broad idea. So, you remember Vault 69? Well, people started to realize what made it so good. Up until this point, prison design theory was basically just throwing together as many high-tech looking, uber-secure contraptions you could think of, with no idea which ones actually worked and which ones were useless, and then just crossing your fingers and praying it all holds together. But Jerry Lum had a systematic way of listing every single weakness he or anyone had ever exploited in a prison and patching them one by one until he reached the ones that no one knew how to patch. This had become the golden standard, and if Sven were ever going to promote a new prison, it would probably be one that checks every box off this list. And so, innovation began. Prisons built with multi-floored cells and regenerating trap portals. Prisons built on the nether roof, since nether portals can't generate there and you can't use cores fruit. Small prisons using area banned force fields to protect people on the inside. Prisons that could trap people against their will. Solitary cells, two-player band checks, anvil walls, end exploit gates, instant redstone, merciful auto panics. But did any of these patch every escape on the list? Elio Citadel. Hmm. Raven's Coffin. Hmm. Neptune's Monument. Ooh. Arctic Bastion? Eh. Loki's Final Vault? Uh, okay, you may be starting to see a pattern. There are some escapes that none of these prisons seem to have nailed down. Soon, they became known as the Universal Escapes, thought to be unpatchable. Ender Pearl Stasis Chambers are self-explanatory. Activate a pearl, escape any prison. Withers were first fully demonstrated in the infamous Wither Drill video. They can literally destroy ban items, so very overpowered. And Chunk Skipping, which in simple terms is launching an entity so fast it basically teleports through unloaded chunks. You can do this with llamas, players, TNT, and even Withers, so kinda overpowered. All this is to say, if you could prevent even one thing on this list, you'd be famous. I mean, that's a big deal. Knock knock. Who is it? It's a guy named Good at this game. He says he just discovered a patch to every single universal escape. Wait, already? How? Said the community. I can't tell you, said Good at this. Why not? Said the community. Because, said Good at this, it's a private exploit. Wait, hang on. So someone finally has the cure all of prisons, but they won't tell us what it is? How did we get here? Oh, of course, Zeo Knight. Remember him? He's the one who designed Operator's Vault for Scene Sven earlier. By the end of 2021, Zeo had discovered something game-breaking in the most literal sense ever. With just one high data shulker box placed at the precise moment a server attempts an autosave, you could force the server to save a corrupted file. It's like the memory ban exploit, but with two main differences. First, it affects region files, which is a 512 by 512 block area. And second, instead of leaving an inaccessible quarter million block area on the server, Minecraft chooses to delete the corrupted file and all the data inside it. With one block, you could vaporize an entire prison. This was the equivalent of a nuclear bomb in Minecraft. It could terrorize hundreds of servers if people knew how to recreate it. And so there was a responsibility not to tell anyone the secret until Minecraft fixed the problem themselves. For the first time, the prison community was exposed to the idea of a private exploit. Eventually, the no region exploit was fixed by the devs, but it left an impact worse than Hiroshima. See, there was obviously the group of people honestly trying to defeat the universe. In fact, they'd recently found out how to patch stasis chambers, but only on one server software. But anyone who didn't have the time or energy to test and study glitches all day now had a loophole to get the same attention. Just tell people that you patched a universal, but since you don't want the method to get leaked, you can't tell anyone. It's the private exploit exploit. One guy, for example, claimed he could get bedrock in the latest version of Minecraft by renaming a name tag in such a way that it would execute a give command without slash op. Another guy said he invented a shulker box that when placed would delete all the entities in a chunk. Of course, 
course, most people didn't take these exploits seriously, but they were almost impossible to truly debunk. Back to Good at This Game, who claims to patch all three universals with just one exploit, a Minecraft time machine, also known as the TRM. I am not joking. I've already explained the crash exploit where the server is forced to revert to the last autosave, but imagine if you could roll the entire server back to any save file of your choosing. It wouldn't matter if the prisoner completely escaped, just roll back the entire server and put him back. Problem solved. What server owner could possibly have a problem with this? Good at This appeared very confident about his exploit though. You really can't tell us how it works? No. And your testing didn't have any mistakes? No. Can you send video proof? No. Can you show us the TRM on a server? No. Does it actually exist? No. I mean, yes. Okay, fine, I can show you. So there's currently an emerald block on this pedestal. If I go up and pull this lever, the server will go back in time to before I placed it and it will disappear. Ready? Okay. Oh my gosh. Obviously the TRM didn't work, did you think I was serious? I could make a whole video about the TRM drama, but what's important right now is that the community was tired of private exploits. And if there's one thing actual experimenters hated more than anything, it was sifting through the attention deficient liars for the real truth. Well, it's already 2022, and it's been a while since anyone has seen seen Sven. Sven. I wonder if his new team has even started building his final prison yet. Well, just 10 days into the year, a very special Minecraft prison started to be developed that was destined to change everything. Cyclonic Convold! A humble little prison on the bedrock edition of Minecraft, led by two people named Xenos and Actually Cope, with four other people contributing, tripling the size of the team. Now, humble and little aren't the right words. In fact, they're the wrong words. See, Xenos was inspired by prisons like Gaia's Vault, an arctic bastion, and if you've seen those prisons before, you can tell. Convold was so elaborate, in fact, that you could just barely load the entire prison at once. Xenos' team was clearly ambitious, but there was one thing holding him back. Liberals. Not in the political way, to be clear. See, many minimalists considered Jerry Lum's style of prison building more scientific, while the kind of prisons that inspired Cyclonic Convold were rooted in a traditional style like Gaia's Vault. And minimalists had a big habit of making fun of old-style prisons for being unnecessarily complicated and redundant. It was literally the prison equivalent of, Ew, that's like so last year, no one builds like that anymore. Yeah, you're just adding random stuff so it looks more complicated than it actually is. Like, yeah, it's just a copy of Gaia's Vault. <laughs> you're so right. Come on, guys, let's go to Lay Daedalus Labyrinth some more. Yeah. yeah! But while the mocking minimalists may diminish the confidence of many redundancy fans, Xenos was not like the other girls. In fact, on February 12th, 2022, he wanted to double down and make his project even more elaborate. He would just have to keep it hidden in the shadows to avoid criticism. Don't listen to what the haters say. Start from scratch. We'll triple the dev team again. Quadruple the size of the prison, keep a top secret, we're going to make the single largest, most sophisticated, secure Minecraft prison in all of history. Told you he was ambitious. All we need now is some rebranding. How about... First thing you'll notice is that Scene Sven still isn't involved. Not yet, at least. He was off fighting a blind woman killer or something, and no one in the end dev had really considered that Sven would be open to sponsoring another prison project, let alone one in Bedrock Edition. In the meantime, it's important to see exactly how Neon would evolve from its infancy. Wait, 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 hold on, hold on. You guys said you're still using Bedrock Edition? <gasps> see you, Knight! Yes, it's me, the guy who shows up at random moments in this story. Here, my child, take this 22 gigabyte RAM, 100 gigabyte storage Java server. See, Zeo Knight had seen leaked screenshots of Neon's progress, and it's a lot of potential, they already had the manpower and the drive, they just needed a powerful enough server to host it. Neon Void was about to step up to the next level AGAIN. First, you know that big cell for prisoners in Daedalus Labyrinth? They were planning to outdo it by a lot, making an even bigger cell, and then three more. Cells A, B, C, and D, all to be fully decorated, as well as over 200 mini cells with a way for outside players to visit any of them. Operating all those cells and visiting hallways would require so much infrastructure, I can only describe it with visuals. The sheer length of guard hallways the stasis chambers, control rooms, auto panic systems, trap portals to defend a four kilometer area, localized lockdown systems that had to be resistant to lag, unload proof prisoner beds, logic circuits, and so much more I don't have time to explain. But Neon Development knew it. They ended up hiring enough workers to triple the size of the team again. How is it growing exponentially? Almost half the active community was working in the shadows on an insanely complicated prison and it showed absolutely no signs of stopping. It was already breaking size records left and right. And I swear this is real, they even got a sponsorship from one of the most under 
good Minecraft server hosts, Wepwewet. And look, just out of curiosity, I checked to see if their promo code still worked, and apparently it does. It's Neon Dev in case you want to use it. And with everyone so excited and dedicated to such a big project, it was hard to see anything going wrong. But let's think analytically for a second. Why were so many people this willing to volunteer unpaid on such a time-consuming project? Well, I mentioned that minimalism was the trendy, progressive way to build prisons, but a lot of people honestly just found building big contraptions in bigly big prisons more fun. I mean, look how cool and big this looks. Who could possibly not like the sheer bigness? Well, we know who. It's those popular kids, of course. They always think they're better than us with their soy, scrawny, beta male prisons. Alright, at this point, I think we need to compare and contrast the two main sides of the community. Redundancy fans like these like to follow the tried and true proven to work strategies. They generally believe that prisons with less redundant features will necessarily be less secure because they have less failsafes. And they believe that minimalists usually only patch escapes and glitches they know of, which leaves them vulnerable and outdated in a few months when new escapes are discovered. Like what happened to Gaia's vault. Minimalists, on the other hand, like to ask questions and do the science. Why do prisons always have two item kill checks when one should be enough? They often invent experimental approaches to prison design. Their main gripe with redundancy fans is they often take features from famous prisons without knowing exactly why they're doing it. For example, Gaia's vault is good, I got this cell design from Gaia's vault so it must be good, without understanding the principles that caused it to be designed that way in the first place. Oh, and minimalists often make an effort to balance security with the theoretical cost of building the prison, so their designs are at least somewhat possible to build in survival. As you can imagine, Neon Void definitely doesn't care about being survival friendly. And all of this would just be harmless opinions on the internet if it weren't for the fact that more vocal members of both sides believe their style is objectively the better approach to building the most secure prison possible. Yeah, there were serious fights and debates about the best way to build a prison in Minecraft. To be clear, this mostly came from the lead builders of Neon and popular minimalist figures. Everyone else was kind of just there to build a big prison and didn't care much about the drama. Good for them. But like I said, Neon Dev was turning into a magnet for people on one side of the argument, and because of how private the project was, Neon development started turning into its own echo chamber, and this is the crucial point. Day by day, that echo had a worse and worse effect on the people inside, especially as they closed the holes and perceived themselves as more isolated from the main community, specifically those quote-unquote popular minimalist figures. Who were those again? Oh yeah, me. And Avatar.png as well. Yep. Collectively, we've made like 95% of popular minimal prisons up to this point, and the two of us are the three largest channels in the active community, so we heavily influence its collective conscience. And because of that, I had just become enemy number one to what was starting to turn into a hate cult, and I don't use that lightly. Higher-ups in the dev team made an active effort to spread their beliefs of Avatar and me to the rest of the build team, going as far as to say we control the community, we ruined it, we divided it, and just leaving my Discord server is heroic? They even coerced them into changing their Discord profile pictures to fit the Neon's face theme. And if being an echo chamber turned Neon into a hate cult, then being a hate cult turned it into a haven for veteran Canadian haters, mostly people who had been banned from my server. So to give you an idea of how that went, the new head builder they hired, I swear I'm not making this up, attempted to hide the n-word on signs hidden across the prison, and by attempted, I mean he did, and no one knows if they're still there or where they are. He also built an insult cave in one of the cells full of insults for all the active members of my Discord server, mostly about being furries and gay. In their minds, it basically became Neon Void versus the degenerate furries that have too much power over us and hate our freedom and traditions. So when I joked that liberals were holding them back, I was only mostly joking. And for the record, I'm not a furry. Anyway, it even got to the point where they were making Neon Void security more redundant solely for the purpose of triggering the libs. Like seriously, Neon was becoming the world's most elaborate troll post, and they definitely weren't afraid to hide it in their many, many trailer videos. But if they truly wanted to prove that this build style was superior to their more reputable enemies, they would have to do what we could not. Patch the universal escapes. Let's do this. First, Stasis Chambers. Now, Stasis Chambers already had a patch, but that patch only works on this server software, and Neon Void was designed for this software. So Xenos experimented with several combinations of server abuse and crashes until he discovered a method that could kill all the Ender Pearls on a spigot server. And that would have actually stopped Stasis Chambers from working until Avatar peer reviewed his testing and realized Xenos' server wasn't killing the Pearls, it just didn't have enough time to save them to memory. The experiment just wasn't thorough enough. Ugh, curse you, Avatar! Fine, he said. We'll give it into the other patch, switch the server to paper, for MC and we'll check Ender Pearl Stasis off the list. Now there's only two left. Wait, there's three left? Yeah, wake up, babe. New Universal just dropped. Light suppression. Apparently, if you cause enough light updates in quick succession, you can stop the entire server from loading new chunks. And if your prison is unloaded, you could just fly into the cell, turn the suppressor off, and let the chunks load again. It's very overpowered. But the minimalists already had a way to patch light suppression and chunk skipping with one simple trick. You see, both of these exploits depend on chunks to be unloaded. But there's one region of every Minecraft world where chunks are always loaded. The spawn region. And so they started building prisons like Mangrove's Eye, 
entirely within world spawn, simultaneously patching two universals. Unfortunately, the spawn region of a world is limited. It's only 300 by 300 blocks wide, and the Void is, well, 7,000. So Xenos would have to find his own way to force chunks to load, and he thought of something pretty clever. Chunk loaders wouldn't work because server restarts shut them off. So what if instead you create a bunch of alt accounts and spread them out across a grid to load the entire prison manually? They would all have hacked clients installed with auto reconnect turned on, so if they ever got kicked or the server restarted, they could log back on right away and keep the entire prison loaded 24-7. It was perfect. Hey wait, you can't use a hacked client. Yeah, why not? Well, if you can use hacks, then the prisoner can too. They could just use reach hacks or something to break their bed and escape, or make themselves immune to area bans, making your entire prison useless. And what do you do if the alt accounts get area banned? What do you do if the server owner doesn't oh, allow also, hacked if you clients? start a light suppressor before the in server fact, restarts, the server then when it comes back enough, up, the hacks not to eventually be able to load light suppression anyway. Like like anyway. 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 Shut up! Dinos was tired of meddling minimalists nitpicking at his project. He reacted by telling his cult he had been harassed by the stupid part of the community, and as a consequence, the project would go into full lockdown. Huh? What are they? To the outside world, they would pretend Neon Void had been cancelled, while they'd continue to work on it in full secrecy. You will pretend Neon Void is dead. You will not talk about Neon outside the Discord server. You will not screenshot or screen share the Discord server. And now, in complete isolation, Xenos was ready to patch the universal that no one else could. The minimalists had certainly tried. We tried every known glitch to acquire bedrock and even private ones. They were all outdated. We tried mob caps, peaceful mode, ender grid, tile ticks, oppressed chunks, everything failed. But Xenos realized that the solution to withers may, ironically, be the opposite of the solution for light suppression. Memory bans. The exploit that could have made the perfect prison. I mean, think about it. If you can't load any of the chunks around the prison, then how do you get close enough to send a wither into it? Basically, if you can get memory bans to work, you can stop people from using withers against your prison. Now, we were pretty sure that memory bands had been patched months ago, but Xenos had just announced his first successful attempt to recreate the mythical memory ban. That's insane! How did you make working memory bands? I can't tell you. Really? No. Well, you've had failed exploits before, do you think your testing may have had mistakes again? No. Can you show us video evidence? No. Can you- <gasps> Deja vu. We've been here before. The minimalists were getting flashbacks. He's just another good at this game. Yeah, why won't he just tell us the method? We're not gonna leak it, and Neon Void is cancelled. Ah, oh, I can't deal with this again. What do we do about it? Hmm... I think? Yeah, I think I have a plan. Meanwhile, Neon Void was nearing completion. Having just patched every single universal, it was literally the perfect prison, so Xenos was ready to invite the biggest name yet to his team. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that's basically how everything works. Wow, that, that's extremely impressive. Thanks, yeah, and it patches withers and stasis chambers and a ton of other escapes you probably wouldn't even understand. Dang, you guys are honestly geniuses. So how do you feel about promoting it? Oh, oh yeah, I can definitely upload this to my channel. This would be perfect for my final prison. Excellent! Uh, do you want to decorate the outside as well? Oh, decorated? Um, how big did you say the prison was again? Oh, uh, 20 billion blocks? Yeah, uh, you guys have fun with that. It was official. Xenos had made it this far, climbing higher up the ladder of prestige, and now Neon Void would be the ultimate scene spend prison. You can't get a better deal. But we still need someone to decorate it so it's not just an obsidian wasteland. Hmm, well, you ever see this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and this? Pretty cool builds, right? And they were all made by one person, Coriolis. Pretty good hire if you want high quality builds. And as Coriolis joined the team, they helped recommend one final person who would join Neon Dev, a person person named Oiremer, who instantly took the role of head redstoner on the dev team. Why? Well, let's put it this way. It's September, one of the most productive months of Neon's timeline, but still four months since they first booted to Java and over seven months since the project began, and they still had a lot left to do. And naturally, the insane speed that Neon was being built at depended on its dozens of workers who, reminder, were all volunteers. And this late in the game, some individual people realized the team was so big that they could stop working and it didn't make much of a difference to the progress. And while most people were still willing to work hard until the scheduled release Date, the rate of production unexpectedly slowing down meant that that date had to be delayed, which caused more people to quit, which delayed it even more. People were starting to actually feel just how absurdly ambitious this whole project was. Even the head redstoner gave up, leaving a gap that needed to be replaced ASAP. And well, this Oirammer guy definitely has a very impressive redstone portfolio. Just look at these screenshots of prisons he's built. What do you say we call him up and offer the job? Hello, Oiremer, or how however you say it. Nice to finally meet you. So, as you already know, progress has slowed down just a bit, so introducing someone with your talent is the kind of good news we need right now. Right now, the we're thinking the same thing. thing. That name definitely is odd, isn't it? Oiremer, it sounds like the opposite of Ifragor, but that's the beauty of it. Watch what happens when you cipher the name four letters back. Oh, 
I sure hope that's a coincidence. Ken, turn around and don't move. Don't call anyone and don't try anything funny. I just want to talk. Okay, okay. How did you know about Neon? That's a good question. Let's roll back two weeks and break it down. In my insatiable need to debunk private exploits, I came up with a plan to learn the secrets of Xenos' memory bank. I created an alt account to infiltrate the project using screenshots of unreleased prisons and prototypes to create a fake identity. Unfortunately for me, while the devs were reviewing my application to join, on September 18th they made the announcement about Neon Void's fake cancellation and told the builders not to screenshot anything on the Discord server. Unfortunately for them, they had just hired Coriolis, the person I talked to more than anyone else. And of course, they told me that Neon was still alive. That rule about not screenshotting was broken not even an hour after it was made. That's ironic. Now I was even more curious. They were hiding more than I thought, but Cory had the perfect plan to get Xenos to trust my alt account. After all, he was still searching for a new head redstoner, so Cory recommended none other than Oiremer. With that, I had successfully broken into Neon Void, and I was starting to discover everything they had said about my friends and I. I started relaying all the incriminating information information to a group chat of fellow minimalists, and we agreed to keep quiet until we had built enough of a case. Privatizing Neon backfired so much their biggest secrets had all been leaked to their worst enemies within just a few hours. Eventually, I scheduled D-Day for October 1st. We were going to reveal everything. And while exposing a secret hate cult about yourself is great and all, it still wasn't what I originally went there to do. I know you've slandered and lied about my friends and I, and I've told them everything. We all know about Neon, how it's run, and everyone involved, including Scenes Fen. But there's just one thing we can't seem to figure out. How did you bring an exploit back from the dead? What exploit? Uh, memory bands? I, I can't tell you. I just need to know your method. Why, so you can take them for yourself? No, no, I don't make prisons anymore. You say you recreated an outdated exploit on a software where it never existed in the first place, and I want you to back that claim. Okay, 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 it's, it's the same as no region, just overload a chunk during an autosave. That's been tested, it just rolls the chunk back. I, I, I don't know what to tell you. I'll ask this one more time and answer honestly. Do memory bands exist? Yes! Hello? Hey, Coke, could you put me up to the loudspeaker? Uh, sure. Code Red, DEFCON 1, there has been a security breach. It was Canadian, he knows everything, and he's going to leak Neon Void, if anyone asks. And no one's gonna ask, but if anyone asks, tell them that last time you checked, Neon Void looked cancelled. Not being worked on in secret, cancelled. Do not leak anything, do not say anything. This could be the end of Neon Void entirely. Is that all? Uh, yep. Thank you, honey. The whole dev team had been pinged five times in the midst of the panic, and they even held a poll to cancel the project for real. Of course, dozens of people had already poured so much time into this, and no one wanted to see it stop halfway. But at the same time, no one really wanted to work. See, I realized a few things when spying on Neon Void undercover. Along with the messed up things the devs were doing, there were also considerable problems with the prison itself. First off, their prison obviously has area bands, but it's built on 1.19, and ever since 1.18, Paper MC patched area bands. Since Neon can't be built on Paper MC, their stasis chamber patch doesn't work. Second, to Neon's credit, they realized their grid of auto-reconnecting players wouldn't fully patch light suppression and chunk skipping, so it was never added. But without loading all the chunks, you can't guarantee that a redstone signal could get from one end of the prison to the other if players aren't loading the whole circuit. So long-distance features in Neon won't function properly. Also, unsurprisingly, many defenses were so colossal they'd only work on really powerful servers without lagging everything. Neon Void was a glorified lag machine. Even their memory band method was never proven to work. It's most likely that the server crashes in their testing were only temporary, and in reality, the crash chunks would eventually seppuku themselves. The legendary exploit that was destined to make Scenesven's perfect prison did not actually exist. Though unlike most private exploits, Xenos and his co-testers really believed they had actually created the impossible. Not that any server owner would allow crash chunks anyway, though they did have a second wither defense that was supposedly immune to the latest in witherbore technology, and as the guy who invented the latest in witherbore technology, yeah, no, no, it's not, it's not. Another poll appeared in December, another in January. They still didn't want to see it go, but now almost a year old, the worst side effect was setting in. Just like Gaia's vault, Neon's tech was becoming obsolete while they hadn't even finished building yet. Escapists recently found a bypass to the ban units Neon uses across the complex. Redesigning and replacing all of them would take weeks. That, and the fact that the list of universal escapes had tripled in the last year, led to the devs' conclusion that Neon Void was only 30% completed. These problems are so fun 
fundamentally linked with how Neon is currently designed that it would be more efficient to completely restart. But thanks to the security breach, morale had just hit zero and all the devs just wanted to finally move on from the project. Over ambition and overconfidence, more specifically faith in private exploits and cure-all solutions, were the only thing keeping a virtually impossible dream alive. On March 13th, 2023, one year, one month, and one day after it started, Neon Void was dead. If there's one good thing that came out of this, it's that reading how Neon felt and talked about us made us realize how condescending and belittling we'd often been. Obviously, being unkind and sarcastic doesn't help people understand you or where they're missing information. It's something I have to remind myself more often than I should need to. And yes, minimalism is the better of the two, but big fancy redstone for the fun of it is also fun. And Neon's devs had character growth too. They had realized how defensive and reactionary many of them had been, to put it lightly, and they understood how nonsensical that thing about me somehow taking away their freedom was. Xenos helped a lot in putting together this story and both of us realized how our perspectives had been closed off from each other. In the end, Neon Void's death had made a divided community a little more compassionate, understanding, and appreciative of each other. Except for Blarperty, he has not changed. And since I know the whole community is watching this, you better keep it that way kids, if I hear you fight one more time we're not getting McDonald- There she is. All these hallways never used, cells never occupied, Baby shoes never worn. This place has over 25 million redstone related blocks. Gaia's vault for reference had under 30,000. When I recorded my first speedrun video, I imagined being in an infinite procedural luminal space of random prison features and rooms, and this is pretty close to what I imagined. The massive floating rectangular rooms remind me of Aperture. I would say you could call this the Minecraft prison backrooms, but they literally already have the entire backrooms just sitting in the corner. As well as a parkour course, another parkour course, working hangman, developer bedrooms, a few Tron references that that's not surprising, and so, so many extra rooms. Ironically, the only thing they did finish was the decorative parts. There's 20 gigabytes worth of architecture, terrain, and void across the world, as well as all four major cells, none of which were ever bigger than the Daedalus cell, by the way. But either way, they are beautiful. Oh my gosh, there are literally wood planks in the cell. 13 months of building and you can escape in five minutes. <sighs> Anyway, I would tell you where you can get the download for Neon Void, but it's not mine to give, though I might make a community post when the devs do decide to release it. Now I can tell at least some of you actually want to learn more about the technical stuff from this video, so seriously, let me know in a comment what you want to learn more about. I might make a video on it, but in the meantime, you can join my Discord server for technical support. The people there are pretty nice. And uh, yeah, subscribe, thank you for watching, and good night.